Welcome to the Inside Scoop Live podcast, where indie authors get personal about their books, their writing, and their passions. I'm your host, Sherry Hoyt. Join me for some lively conversations with debut indie authors and seasoned veterans alike. It's a great place to find your next amazing read or even get inspired. So sit back and enjoy the show and let me know what you think. Hi, everyone. Joe Cooling is on the show today to talk about her book, Child Protection Behind Closed Doors. It's a behind the scenes look at what really happens at child protection. Before we get started, here's the inside scoop on the author. The life of Joe Cooling is like living in a theme park. One minute, it's like riding a roller coaster, baking cupcakes, cookies, and slices, with a kitchen covered with chocolate, flour, and cooking utensils, trying to develop new tastes and ideas for her growing baking business. Sometimes she feels like she travels through life in a dodgem car. All the while, she works to complete two novels while caring for two cavoodles, who believe their mother was placed on this earth purely to play with them 24 hours a day. But no matter how out of control her life can be at times, eventually she ends up sailing around on the Walt Disney teacup ride on top of the world. When she relaxes, the cavoodles see this as an opportunity to snuggle on mum's lap. Joe's work career has been just as colorful as her current life. She has worked in horse and car racing, sold lingerie, designed websites, been a personal assistant, and worked as a law clerk. Joe looks at life like a box of chocolates. Each day unwraps a new layer, revealing unexpected flavors and textures. And you can learn more about Joe Cooling and her work at joecooling.com. Well, hi, Joe. Welcome to Inside Scoop Live. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I feel very special. Oh, well, you are. You are. You wrote a book. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about your book, Child Protection Behind Closed Doors. What's it about and what was your inspiration for writing it? Well, initially, uh, I started writing it more for mental health reasons. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get what was in my head down on paper And what happened was I left for medical reasons. I uh, had an epileptic seizure and I decided that, you know, after the second seizure, I thought, no, that's too risky. I'd hate myself if I had a child in my arms and I had a seizure or I was in the car. So I decided that I would not go back to work. Uh, Somebody uh, from child protection actually contacted me and said, oh, Joe, by the way, when you left child protection, management stated to us that everyone was to cease contact with you. And I thought, you know what, that's it. I've had enough. There's just too much in my 10 years that happened. And I thought the people really need to know what actually goes on at child protection, because I'm sure a lot of people don't really know. And that's when I thought I'm turning this into a book. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. one of those topics too. It's like you want to know, but you don't want to know what's going on because you hear horror stories, you know? Oh, um, definitely, definitely. So that's how it turned into a book. Yeah. Yeah. So how did your experience with youth suicide shape your path into child protection? Okay. So I've always been the type of person who wants to help people. Uh, mm-hmm. Even as a child, I was always you know, that type of person. And obviously when a family member in, you know, my experience commits suicide, you know, the family falls apart. It changes your perception on life. So after that, I thought to myself, did I miss something? Was there a sign? Could I have changed the outcome? And that's when I decided to leave my job and uh, start studying because I was in the corporate sector. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew straight away that child protection was my avenue. That's where I wanted to go. I had my daughter at 18. So even though I was young, I stopped and I'm like, you know what? I'm not an adolescent anymore. I'm a mother. Mm -hmm. I stopped and I go, that's it. I can't go out and party. I can't do this. And I was a mother straight away. Yeah. Uh, So, you know, I already had that experience of being a mother anyway. I didn't get into uh, child protection until I was 31. So I had life experience. So that's basically what pushed me was the experience of what my family went through with a young suicide in the family. Yeah, that's awful. I, yeah. I love how a little bit of something good come from it. You know, you, you yeah. found your calling, so to speak. So yeah, yeah. yeah. 
what did you hope to accomplish with this book? Like, were there any misconceptions about child protection work that you wanted readers to know? That is a hard one uh, because I suppose there is a lot of misconceptions about child protection, but I looked at myself as being a different type of child protection worker because, I don't know, being a little bit older, when I did interviews, I didn't take the person at face value on that very first time that I met them because you, you're walking into someone's life and going, mm-hmm. you know, hello, we've received your report on blah, blah, blah. And, you know, a lot of people are shocked. You know, they're like, oh, my goodness. And so they're initially, uh, hang on a minute, we're we haven't done anything wrong they get quite aggressive and so a lot of workers walk in and go okay i'm going to write down you're aggressive you're this you're that i don't take people like that i i stop and i i then say look let's calm down um look it's just a report and then you know so i I look at it and i go look you know not all child protection workers are like that we're not all crap (laughs) yeah so it's not like if you get a call or a visit from child protection, that means you're going to lose your kids. This is like an yeah. interview. Yeah. And I think a lot of workers also to get blamed for management's bad decisions. Mm. And while workers, you know, strive to protect children, they face a lot of challenges such as high caseloads, systemic issues, which impact their effectiveness. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? And... Uh, also, you know, a child protection system is used by also many parents to fight family law court issues, which also, again, impacts caseloads. Oh, yeah. 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 Tell me about some of the typical dangers, and, and you mentioned a few challenges, as a child protection mm. worker might mm. face out in the field. Regular verbal abuse. That's a given. And, you know, so that's why a lot of the young ones really struggle with it. Whereas being a little bit older, you sort of need to just learn to brush that off. Uh, Long working hours, definitely. Uh, Large caseloads. And that's never going to change. It doesn't matter what they try and bring in. That's always going to be there. You know, because you've got things like you've got to meet, you know, your key performance indicators, um, you know, as well as court ordered conditions. A lot of people that come into child protection are social workers. They have to almost have to be retrained. It's really? not a social. It's not a social worker role. Okay, this is a statutory role. Okay, I, see, not, I would think that would be a misconception. Yeah, you're not there to counsel people. You're not being invited into people's lives. This mm-hmm. is a statutory role, and a lot of people that come into the role don't understand that. So they come in as a social worker and they virtually have to unlearn everything they've learned. Hmm, That's interesting. Yeah. I would have thought it would have been a kind of social worker, at least part of the role, you know? Oh, look, definitely. But you're not there to counsel people that not all of them, but uh, it's court ordered. A lot of it's court ordered. And that's one challenge Mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't understand and the court process part of the role scares a lot of people and they really struggle with that whereas with me I've worked in the courts since I was 18. Oh wow. Yeah. Yeah. The other side of the role that is really difficult for a lot of people uh, is working with people that really challenge your comfort zone, your morals, And when I say that, I'm talking about sex offenders, pedophiles, because, Mm. you know, you can't be interviewing a person that has potentially sexually offended a child. And you need to be able to learn to speak with those people without judging them, you know, and uh, treating them with disrespect. And that is very difficult to do at times. Yeah, I imagine. It takes a special kind of person, that's for sure. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. You know, I had one case, which is in the book, and, um, you know, I was doing an access visit 
And um, he'd already been convicted. Uh, anyway, he was sitting there and having his access visit and I'm just sitting there and watching and, you know, mm-hmm. keeping my eye on things. And he's trying to groom me and, you know, start a conversation. And, you know, I said to him, look, you're here to have access with your child. You know, you either have your access or I'll just cancel it straight away. Wow. You know, so, you know, you've got your boundaries and uh, sometimes you, you really do, you struggle. I bet I'm struggling just listening to you. My goodness. Yeah. What kind of turnaround does the agency have? Okay, back when I was doing it, it was around 89%. And that was most workers is about 18 months, which is wow. pretty high. Yeah. From what I've read, I don't think that's improved a lot. Yeah. Um, so that then impacts on clients because you look at it from a child's perspective, from a family's perspective, if they're having regular workers quit, how difficult is that for a client, for a child, constantly having new workers coming, coming, coming time and time again, and then having to get used to new people and having to repeat their story over and over again? Yeah, the impact on the family is, I can't imagine just having to tell the story over and over again and and the kids having to get comfortable with someone new every month or 18 months. Mm, Yeah, and I suppose that goes into uh, also with the bullying as well. That goes down to the workplace culture and another reason why workers aren't lasting. Workers having numerous sick days, which puts pressure on other workers to pick up their cases, you know, workers resigning, the post-traumatic stress disorder, Mm -hmm. you know, which is to do with the bullying and it just goes on and on. It's the impact of numerous things. Where does that culture come from? I mean, how does that get ingrained into such a workforce that is constantly turning around new workers? That's a hard one because the one thing that you've actually done for me in organizing this podcast you've actually made me think a lot deeper than Mm. just book so what i've been doing in the last few weeks is thinking how can i actually go beyond just getting my book out there for the normal everyday person to read and Mm. understand and is actually looking at how can I actually go that little bit deeper. So I've been looking at the politicians and looking into them and what they've said. And now I've started looking into actual reforms and and what's gone on with child protection over the years. And I've really struggled to find any real reform over the last 10 years about anything that's really of any substance and it's just been figures and I think well where's it actually come from where's this bullying come from why is there such a big turnaround Mm -hmm. and I honestly don't know you mentioned you've got messages from people you worked with saying that they were to not contact you anymore not make contact with you anymore do you know what triggered that shift did you find out No, no, I didn't. But I spoke to that particular worker recently because I just let her know that, you know, the book was out. Mm. And uh, she said to me that after she left that they did the same thing to her. And she believed that she actually got pushed out Mm. because of her friendship with me. Huh. Yeah, I I have no idea. Okay, okay. I was just curious. Mm. Now, in the book, you write about a lot of serious subject matter, um, heavy heavy stuff. Uh, Did you make a conscious decision to inject humor into some of the writing? Oh, definitely, definitely, because uh, you won't get through child protection unless you can inject humor. Mm. It's the same as most types of jobs like that, the police, doctors. Mm-hmm. That type of thing. It's uh, you won't last very long unless you can and look at the lighter side. And you will find if you do get into those type of industries, we all do tend to bind together. But I'm like that anyway. You know, my mum is uh, has terminal cancer, and the two of us, you know, humour is everything. Even though what she's got, you know, they can't operate 
we're laughing all the time. And uh, she was saying to me that uh, when she had a biopsy, they put titanium staples in and I said and she told me how much they cost and I said oh I said when you go I said I'll be opening you up and taking those uh, bad boys out and cashing those in and uh, <laughs> she as she told my auntie and uh, my auntie said oh she wouldn't and and uh, I said to my mum oh seriously I said you know not only is it illegal but morally wrong and um, the last time we were at the oncologist she got a very good report and uh, <clears throat> the oncologist said to me I was jumped straight on my phone she goes what are you doing I said I'm just ringing the builder to cancel the extension on the house oh my goodness and, and mum and I are on the floor in tears and uh, but you have to you know so yeah you know it is a serious matter and but that's just the way that I am and um, I'm serious when I have to be serious and you know when I try and put humor in yeah. when I can but also in my book there's also a lot of Obviously, the little positive sayings and at the end mm. of each story uh, to try and, you know, say, hey, this is serious, this has happened. But, you know, it doesn't matter what happens in life, you can get through it. Yeah. Do you want to give us a, an example or two about some cases? Yeah, definitely. Miss Daisy is probably a perfect case. For 10 years, she never worked with the department ever. Three children removed from her care, violence, uh, especially towards child protection workers, drugs and alcohol throughout the whole 14 years. Mm. Um, when I became involved, she had three kids out of her care. She was pregnant with her fourth child. So uh, we currently had a, a report uh, once she had the baby that we were to be notified and a protective application would be taken out on that baby as well. Mm. Anyway, so obviously because of the violence, um, we were prepared. So we went in there uh, as soon as she had the baby, which I hate doing, but went in there and um, I said to her, look, I apologise. I really didn't want to do this, but, you know, we do have to take out a protection application. It won't be that we're taking the baby, but you can't leave the hospital with the baby. Anyway, mm -hmm. so we worked together. There was no aggression, no nothing. She did really, really well. She did everything right. And um, yeah, she got all the kids back in her care, got off the drugs and alcohol. In fact, her very last drug screen, clear, came back clear. Oh, I was so happy. I took it to her and I said, we've got to frame this. She goes, what? Clean. She was so excited. Anyway, I, I said to her at the very end, what was so different? Why did you decide after, you know, 14 years that you were just going to work with the department? She said to me, because you treated me like a human being. Mm. That was it. And I treated everyone like that. Wow. Wow. That makes all the difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Yep. And I suppose the other story that really, really sticks out to me is Angel. This story just will never, ever leave me. Little Angel was two and mum had had two kids removed from her care previously. Anyway, so dad was in the chair, you know, just relax watching television. Mum came up, stabbed dad in the chest. Uh, the knife went directly into dad's chest, straight through the heart. Oh came my out, goodness. Straight out through the spine, died instantly. She mm. pulled the knife out, wiped it went and cut a uh, little angel a piece of cake with green icing. She put angel next to dad's body in a little chair and table, put the cake down. And uh, anyway, when the matter went to court, she, uh, the good thing about, or the lucky thing about this case was that angel's uncle uh, and uh, auntie were actually working in the child psychiatry area which was good you know it was probably the only blessing in this case uh, so she was at least able to stay with family and uh, you know she was in the best care that she could be uh, but mum you know she tried to blame dad he was an alcoholic uh, he was abusive but during my investigation I couldn't find 
anything, any indicator that there was violence in the relationship. You know, there was no doctor's appointment, no one that she went to, no domestic violence outreach, no friends, no nothing to indicate that there was any violence. Not even on that day, you know, dad was in a relaxed state. Um, You know, the homicide detective gave uh, evidence that there was nothing to indicate that that she was in any danger at that yeah. time. Anyway, on the day of court. Uh, now, this case was so unique that they opted not to hear it in the children's court um, family division. They chose to have it heard in the criminal court. Mm-hmm. And anyway, I said to my lawyer, I want the triple zero call played. And um, mum's lawyer said, no, we're not having it played. You've got the printed version. I said, no. The only voice that little girl has is on that tape. It was horrific, absolutely horrific. Mm. Everyone broke down. Even the magistrate struggled. It was just horrific. That young girl at the age of two ended up having uh, been put on antipsychotic medication. Oh, my. Just horrific. Um, Yeah. Yeah. You know, I actually Google searched her name because she's got a very unique name and she's actually doing really well. You know, Good. the first time I went and saw her, now this little girl never let anyone into that house. And uh, I went in there and uh, I sat down on the floor and she just had her face painted. And uh, anyway, I actually uh, had professional face painting stuff. I used to paint kids' faces all the time. And uh, anyway, so the next time I went in there, I took all my face paints and uh, I did face painting with her. And she allowed me always into the house, hugging me, taking me (laughs) into her room. And uh, anyway, so I left my face paints there for her uh, because my my kids had grown up by that stage. Yeah. um, You know. And yeah, and the auntie said she's never let anyone into this house ever. Wow. And uh, yeah, so my mum said to me the other day, did you have all these stories written down? And I said, no, you, they just never leave you. Yeah, you know? I imagine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. What do you consider the most pressing issues plaguing the child protection system today? Okay. Um, look, I think... The issues are probably still very similar. So lack of support by management. Also, uh, the foster care system, which also covers, you know, residential care, really the whole out-of-home care system. I think that's still a huge issue. Um, So, you know, vetting uh, the foster carers to ensure the safety of children in out-of-home care placements. Uh, The turnover rate of staff is obviously still a huge issue issue and I think a huge one even today is the lack of transparency between the states of the child protection care system. Oh wow. Yeah. I, I think I think that's huge because I had that one issue with um, when you do an intake document it's only a few sentences maybe the, the smallest paragraph that another state or another uh, report writes for you to go, okay, blah, blah, blah. I think that is massive. I think that there needs to be uh, more transparency between the states so that one family can't move from one state, come to another, uh, you know, move from state to state and be a a massive issue, Um, you know, where they have a, a family in one state and then move to another and all of a sudden you've got 10 years and, you know, I had one family and I'll be very quick, Uh, who had nine children in one state, came down to Victoria. Now, they had all those children removed permanently. They weren't allowed to have contact until those children were 18. They came to Victoria, had another seven children. Hello. We didn't pick that up. And these children, you know, had some in primary school, some in high school, and this was huge concerns. We're talking environmental neglect, uh, emotional neglect, sexual abuse, physical abuse, huge. That was because of lack of transparency from one state to the other. Wow. I guess if you could implement like three long-term solutions to improve the system, sounds like it would definitely be at the top of your list. Do you have any other suggestions? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, also, uh, I think if serious complaints are made against team leaders or unit managers, I think there should be an independent assessor, not within the department. 
Uh, I also think that if a child protection worker, uh, if the department wanted a child protection worker to see a medical personnel, whether it be a doctor, a psychiatrist, uh, I think it should not be the department's medical personnel. I think it should be a GP or a psychologist, psychiatrist that the worker chooses. Because mm-hmm. I know when I went and saw them, they tried to use that against me. I was lucky enough that I was smart enough to go and see my own psychiatrist. So I was able to counteract whatever they said because they used one report that I saw a, a, one, a psychiatrist once who tried to say that, uh, you know, that I was not fit for child protection, whereas I went and saw a psychiatrist over a three-month period who was able to say, hang on a minute, mm. no, no, no. So I was lucky I and I also think drug and alcohol screening probably needs to occur as well. Uh, you know, oh, that you... surprises me that it's not a standard. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I okay. know, definitely. And you know what? I actually think that a royal commission probably needs to happen within child protection. And I'm not talking about, yes, there's been royal commissions into, um, you know, sexual abuse within the out of home care and that. I'm talking about a, a royal commission within child protection within bullying within treatment of workers within uh, you know that type of thing not within you know the sexual abuse of out of home care i'm I'm talking within the actual child protection service itself and also within uh, what i've been looking at is we're, we're talking about we're battling mental health we're battling you know drug and alcohol and domestic violence and deaths within the system you know the government is spending all money on all these campaigns maybe they need to look at getting involved with how the violence occurs in the first place i mean child protection are dealing with probably the children that are now adults that are perpetrating this violence, why aren't we looking at at the very start when child protection are dealing with these children that are being exposed to the violence but they're then growing up and becoming the perpetrators? Why are we dealing with it at the very end and not at the very start? Yeah, that's a good point. Wow. Yeah. I'm inspired to hear that you are taking the next step to kind of look in to see what you can do, you know, in a different capacity now that you're not working within the system anymore. Uh, That's encouraging. What do you hope readers will carry away with them after reading your book? What do you hope kind of sticks with them? Okay, not only just having, giving an insight into the role of child protection, but inspiration to people and that we all have challenges in life, but it doesn't mean that things are that bad, that they can't be resolved. So uh, what is next for you? Will you write another book? Yeah, well, actually, I was writing two books at the same time. And (laughs) I was because, you know, as you mentioned, child protection is a very heavy topic. So um, when I sort of got sort of stuck on writing that or I'd had enough, I'd I'd flip over to the other book. Uh, So anyway, if you have a question that ends in, that's bullshit, that's my second book. That's what I'm writing. So it basically, <laughs> if you've ever been ripped off, treated unfairly, or come up against big companies, little businesses, or just been treated with disrespect, uh, you know, telephone companies, hospitals, mechanics, even the government, that's my next book. Okay. No one's no one's safe in my next book. And you Uh-oh. know, if anyone that reads this book, my you know, child protection behind closed doors, you know I don't hold back and I'm definitely not holding back on my next book. <laughs> okay. Well maybe we can revisit once that one comes out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So <laughs> all right. Well, Joe, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing with us a little bit about yourself and your work and, and your book. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining me today for my interview with Joe Cooling author of Child Protection Behind Closed Doors. You can learn more about Joe and her work at joecooling.com. And be sure to check out our other interviews at insidescooplive.com.